2022. Please note this meeting may be filmed for live or subsequent broadcast via the Scarborough Council website. The formal webcasting notice is published at the top of this agenda item. Section 1, Declaration of Interest. Do I have any Declaration of Interest? Councillor Anderson. Yes, thanks, Chair. I'm not sure if uh, we need to do it because it's going to be a full council decision. But I'd like to declare an interest in uh, agenda item A6, proposal of Hon Honorary Alderman. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Jefferson. It's a similar thing to Councillor Anderson that, that now our name is mentioned within the category of Honorary Alderman, Alderman Alder Woman. And also, um, I will declare an interest that I am president of the Scarborough Chamber of Trade and Commerce and that I have my own business, the train shop in Eastborough, with regard to the financial outturn and any such things with regard to the local plan, please. OK. Thank you. Any further declarations? No. Item two, minutes of the last meeting, which was held on the 15th of November. Um, I wasn't in attendance, so can I have a proposer and a second? Councillor Collin, Councillor Council Moore. Thank you. I'll sign those off. Also, it would probably be more appropriate to get Councillor Collins to sign those off, wouldn't it? So I'll leave those for you to sign off. Item three, public question time. Do we, do we have any public questions, Chief Exec? Uh, leader, there's no public questions have been received. Thank you. Item four, forward plan. The forward plan is as published. Uh, are there any comments, questions, further additions? No, thank you. Item five, <clears throat> progress of scrutiny of executive decisions. Leader, there have been no calling of executive decisions since the last meeting on the 15th of November. Thank you. Mm. Item A6, proposal of honorary aldermen and older women. Um, we've come round to this time of the year again where, uh, where we look at those councillors who have uh, served uh, a minimum of 16 years on, on this council and, uh, and are eligible for the title of honor, <coughs> honorary alderman uh, or older women, subject to them not being actually in post at the time. Um, the recommendations that are set out on this paper include a number of, uh, a number of people. It's uh, quite a long list this time. Uh, there's quite a lot of people who've who've served a minimum of 16 years, and uh, they're all eligible. And assuming that uh, we agree with this list, they will be um, approved uh, at a council meeting on the 20th of March this year. The, the only other, I suppose, unusual one in here is uh, Councillor Hazel Linsky, who, who recently passed away. And, um, and the recommendation is that she be given uh, a posthumous award uh, as alderman. So, um, having said that, uh, I don't know if there's anything else anyone wishes to add. I think it's a fairly straightforward piece of work that we do every year. Uh, if there's no questions, shall we move to a vote? Uh, all those in favour of that list? That's unanimous. Thank you. Item, item eight, uh, performance management framework, quarter two report, 22-23. Councillor Jefferson. Financial report, first Sorry, I've missed out the seven. financial report. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Always better with a paper copy. Right. Item seven, financial outturn 21-22 and 22-23 with financial monitoring update to 30th of September 22. Councillor Jefferson. Thank you, Leader. Um, I'll do an over overview and then I'll hand over to Kerry, Head of Finance, for any update she wants to bring. Members, the Council is committed to a performance management culture which underpins a focus on continuous improvement and the report before Cabinet today, prepared by Kerry Metcalf and her financial team, certainly fulfils that commitment. And as Cabinet Member for Corporate Resources, I am very proud to present this financial outturn, 21-22 and 22-23,
Finance Report today, which provides an update on the quarter two financial monitoring report presented to Cabinet in November 21. The report also provides the final outturn position for the year, together with a financial monitoring update and forecast outturn projection for the new current financial year, based on figures available to the end of September 22. This is the first financial monitoring report for 22-23 year, and bearing in mind the finances team additional workload associated with COVID and local re government reorganisation, with just over three months before our council is abolished, I would like to put on record our appreciation to all our finance staff, who through their careful management of our resources have produced the uplifting report before us today. The 2022 financial strategy approved by members in February of 22 set out, amongst other things, that uncommitted reserve balances of 8 million, 5 million held in risk management reserve and 3 million in general fund reserve will be transferred to the new Yorkshire Unity Council on the 31st of March 2023. The report before us today confirms that despite that and despite the pr produced prudent outturn overspend of 1 million for the current 22-23 financial year, due to exceptional inflationary cost pressures on staffing costs, utilities and fuel, which will be, which will be cleared and funded from earmarked reserves, that the Council will transfer the uncommitted reserve balances of at least 8 million to the Yorkshire, North Yorkshire County Uni Council on the 31st of March, and that in addition to the 8 million, the Council will hold additional currently uncommitted resources of 7.288 million, which is made up of 2.288 million underspend surplus, which has been transferred to the General Fund Reserve and detailed within the balanced 2021 22 statements of accounts together with 4 million in additional capital receipts generated from asset sales and 1 million in monies earmarked for the progression of schemes in the Scarborough and Whitby blueprint. The transfer of more than 15 million in uncommitted reserve balances to the North Yorkshire Council demonstrates the prudent and responsible approach this Council has adopted for its finances and the strong financial controls that are in place. With regard to the revenue budget outturn for 21-22, the significant 2.288 million outturn budget surpluses are set out in 3.14 and Appendix A, relating the main to car parking and seasonal income of 1.011 million, re relating to relaxation and ultimate removal of COVID restrictions, and we got the staycation and lots of visitors. 750,000 business pool rate pool dividend from prior year, 380,000 business rate refunds, 800,000 new burdens funding, COVID grant test and trace, and 350 salary savings. Shortfalls included 421,000 spa and pavilion, 175,000 on the OAT, open air theatre, of which 100,000 planned health and safety works, plus deferral of the repayment at of the stage re-COVID. There was 220,000 cleansing uh, increased staffing due to increased demand and agency staff re-COVID and 400,000 on utilities. Quarter two reported a projected 959,000 outturn. Main variations against projection were business rate pool dividends plus 400,000 new burn burdens funding and 380,000 business rate refunds. When the 21-22 budget was set, the country was in the midst of the COVID pandemics and lockdown, so a £920,000 COVID contingency budget was established as part of the budget to fund COVID-related cost pressures should they arise. However, only 170000 of this budget was utilised in the year and the remaining 750000 was held in earmarked reserves. The projected in outturn for 22-23, as at 30th of September 22, under three, item 3.2, the projected outcome for the current year is a prudent estimate of 1 million overspend, which is detailed under item 3.2.2 and Appendix B, 
is being driven by unavoidable inflationary cost pressures such as utilities and pay. Examples being 600,000 overpend spay award, pay award provided 3% or actual 1,925 uplift for staff, with, with high proportion of lower paid staff receiving much greater than 3% and 660,000 attributable to utilities and fuel. Other budget issues identified in the report at 3.2.2 which our finance staff th think will re uh, recur next year, have been flagged up as part of the North Yorkshire budget setting process. Under new capital schemes, the 2022 financial strategy included in principle approval for the establishment of various capital budgets within the capital programme, and Cabinet are recommended to approve the establishment of budgets for the schemes detailed within item three, which are Filey Toilets, Whitby Beach Chalets, South Bay Chalets, Scarborough, Filey Chalet Refurbishments, Concrete Chalets, South Bay, Filey Paddling Pool. The summary of the above is detailed on pages 8 and 9 of the report. Capital money is earmarked to progress Scarborough and Whitby blueprints. The 2022 financial strategy identified a funded capital budget of £4 million, which members previously committed to progress schemes identified in the Scarborough and Whitby blueprints. Four million has not yet been formally committed within the capital programme. However, it is attended that three million of the funding will be allocated to provide match funding to port the town fund West Pier De redevelopments project in Scarborough. The commitment of the three million pound budget allocation to the West Pier project has been approved as part of the Section 21 general consent provided by North Yorkshire County Council on the 23rd of May 2022 with the approval of an eight million budget for the project, including five million town deals grant. However, the allocation has not been formally approved by Cabinet. The total project cost for the West Pier redevelopment is currently estimated at circa 11.5 million, with further funding allocation to be funded from the local investment fund on an investor save basis, and the property asset management capital allocation these funding allocations will be subject to additional approval and a report on the proposal will be presented to Cabinet in the new year. The blueprint includes aspirations to deliver a cinema within the borough and this report puts a marker in the sand regarding the intention that we want to progress the cinema proposal and sets out that monies are being transferred to the new North Yorkshire Unitary Council to do so. However, as the decision will likely come forward after the 31st of March 2023, this will be a North Yorkshire Council decision and present has no Section 24 consent. Under property management and infrastructure, that's on page 12. I think there's a page missing somewhere here. <laughs> Can you print it for me? Pardon? I think that was that, yeah. Kerry reprinted something for me, but I think it's all there. But I will, I will hand over to Kerry Metcalf, our Head of Finance and Interim 151 Officer, to give more details and answer any questions, especially on the assessment at the end and the monies, etc. And I will propose the recommendations of items 1, little 1 to little 6 on pages 1 and 2 of this report and come back and do that. I so move. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. Kerry? Thanks, Councillor Jefferson. So I think Councillor Jefferson has given a really comprehensive overview of the report, so I'm not going to go through everything um, in detail again. I think it's probably worth reiterating a couple of points that Councillor Jefferson raised. So firstly, that we're looking to transfer in excess of £15 million across to the new North Yorkshire Council when it comes into existence on the 1st of April. And I think that demonstrates how prudently and responsibly this council has managed its finances over the years. Um, the second point um, I'd just like to touch upon is the overspend for the current year. So the report sets out the project with that we're projecting a million pound overspend um, in the current year. Um, but we do believe that that's a very prudent estimate and we do expect that that position will improve in the remainder of the year. That overspend is also driven by exceptional and unavoidable cost pressures that we've seen um, in the year that we couldn't have foreseen when we set the budget back in February. Um, and those pressures that have been experienced nationally, they're not just specific to this council. 
Um, so I believe that in summary, this report sets out the Council, that this Council will hand over a very sound financial position to the new North Yorkshire Council when it comes into existence on the 1st of April. I'm happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions from members? Councillor Colin. Um, firstly, congratulations on keeping us on track. And um, as a North Yorkshire councillor, I'm very grateful for the handover, even though we are saying that some of that money we want to earmark for future use. I've got a specific question around Project Sunshine. When we pulled the list together, um, we committed the capital to do so many of the list. And there were some things we didn't do. They're quite small scale, but they would make quite a big difference in a locality. Will we be able to fund any of that work before we cease to exist? I think if the work can be accommodated within current workloads, um, absolutely. We are aware of some capital monies which are uncommitted um, and are available within our capital resources. So yes, we can bring some proposals forward, subject to them not being captured by the Section 24 um, regime. So yes, absolutely. Any other questions from members, uh, from cabinet members? Councillor Anderson. Uh, not, such, not so much a question, but a, a comment regarding uh, the excellent work that's gone on by uh, from Paul Thompson and his, uh, and his team. Um, this relates to 333 Fairly Toilets. It's some, this work that we said we'd uh, uh, try to complete um, over the, the period of our tenure as uh, an administration. And I think we're well on the way to completing that work. I'm sure Farley uh, residents and uh, uh, holiday makers alike will be absolutely delighted with the toilet, uh, toilet box that's going to be uh, put in there. Thanks, Chair. Oh, thank you. I think it's worth, uh, worth reminding uh, everyone that when this administration was uh, elected, it was to deliver on, on a, a whole range of things that uh, I think it's fair to say that we've been very successful at doing. And um, uh, I think many people would say, if we only had another year or two, uh, if LGR hadn't come along for another year or two, that, that we would get those things done. And that would make some huge differences to people who live in the borough moving forward. Um, I, I hope that as we move into, into the new authority in April, that, that the new authority will, will continue the work that we've started. And, and as has been raised earlier on, um, we have allocated funding for many of these schemes and uh, there, there are quite a number of schemes uh, around the borough, including our housing, uh, our absolutely um, first rate housing uh, joint venture scheme, our, uh, our cinema proposals that we're working with, uh, with private sector on, uh, and a new hotel and a number of other schemes that, that are in the pipeline. And I hope that uh, we can continue working in the time we have left with, with our partner authority to make sure those schemes get the go ahead. Uh, so that's really, really good news. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question from Councillor Backhouse. Uh, thank you, Councillor Siddons, <coughs> Cabinet and Members Officers. Um, this is a little bit of a, a mop up for myself in regards to my time as the audit chair and just trying to pick out some salient points within this. Overall and broadly speaking, it's a very positive report this, certainly going forward with the reserves that we are looking to transfer to the new North Yorkshire Council as when that comes to be. Um, one thing that I'm keen, as I'm sure many, <laughs> many members will be, is the, uh, the closure of the accounts in regards to the Whitby Harbour's ongoing situation. And of course, referencing 3.6 in the available resources, and uh, in particular, the monies to be transferred to North Yorkshire Council, 3.6.2. It um, <coughs> references that there is a confidence that there'll be sufficient funds um, to uh, mitigate the risks that we've been exposed to, including such as the one surrounding the treatment of income at Whitby Harbour. Now, obviously, I'm aware that that's gone out for legal opinion, consideration and some land allocation determination, whether it's harbour land or not. And obviously, um, I want to know where we are with that. And is there, has there been a pre-decision consideration given legally in regards to where we feel this is going to sit? Because um, I think that's quite important, certainly for the members who have had a, a long interest in that. Um, 
that that's the first one, if I may, uh, yeah, rather than come back. Um, in regards to the cumulative reserve to be transferred over the 15 million, and uh, picking up on what Councillor Collins said, in regards to some of that will be hopefully ring fenced for use within the borough. Is that a small percentage, large percentage, majority or not, or is that still to be discussed and negotiated? Because I feel that when you speak to residents, whether it's elected, non-elected, lay people, business people, when the money's coming from activities uh, within this borough, and we, we have created that pot, nobody else, it's good officers and good members that have done that, that there should be some strength of challenge to ensure that, that 15 million circa is actually spent on the projects to fulfil the plans that we agreed on previously when we first came to pass. So that I would like a comment to, please. And thirdly, um, we are, I say we, we as backbench members are aware of the commissioning of the KPMG report about the challenge to the VAT treatment of the DBID. We are aware of timescales of issue of invoice and payment of, as obviously East Riding East Yorkshire Riding Council did the same as well. Um, I also understand that there has been a objection uh, validated by Mazers to the draft accounts of 21-22 on this specific subject. With the report being commissioned at the, uh, I'll, I'll use a broad sense, the request of the members of the audit upon discussion with financial officers that it was prudent to do so because there is a specialism within the VAT field that we don't have that specialism and we hold our hands up to that. And we interpreted the operational rules of the DBID, certainly sections 15 and 18, to the best of our knowledge at that time of implementation. Now, when it was deemed prudent that the challenge should be furthered by commissioning this report, um, using what in a sense is public monies, then one could assume, rightly or wrongly, and this is for the clarification point, that that becomes a public report. And of course, it may or may not have a bearing on any upcoming court cases which have been deferred to January ongoing. And depending on the report itself, uh, which I understand is in receipt within certainly these buildings, um, there may be future challenges upon that outcome. So can I have some, um, some confident words that there is no detrimental impact to this authority in those words of that, that report? Because it's not only us, it's, it's East Yorkshire Council as well, of course, there's many elected members watching this. And of course, part of this happened on my watch as the chair of the audit. So I would like to see some closure. I would like to hear some confidence from officers and elected leader of this council that there is nothing negative in that KPMG report. And if that is the case, then why is it not being released to members who have requested? I haven't requested it. I shall say that openly. I have not openly requested that report, but I know that some members have and have been rebutted. And I would wish to know the reasons for that because clearly it is not only elected members watching that. There's a lot of, lot of small businesses. A lot of people have a reliance upon clarity, um, the reliability of our interpretation of rules, and I'll say that as a collective responsibility now. And if that is deemed to be um, unfortunately not correct, then we collectively again should be saying, yep, absolutely, we got it wrong, or cheering from the rooftops that we got it right. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Bacchus. Um, I'll, I'll come back to your second question in a moment, but if I ask uh, the monitoring officer, uh, Mrs. Dixon, to to um, respond to question one and three. Okay, thank you, leader. So, with regard to the Whitby Harbour accounts, um, I can direct members' attention to a report that was re um, published on the 14th of October, which was um, a monitoring officer decision. Unusually, we took the steps of putting a public report out on, in relation to the Whitby Harbour proceedings and the conduct of those proceedings because we felt it was really important that information was in the public domain. That report um, dealt with the way that the, proceeding, the ongoing proceedings are being dealt with through the, 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 the legal process. And it referred to the fact that the objector's solicitor had sought an extension um, from the council until the, uh, initially the 21st of October to serve their acknowledgement of service and evidence to support their case. 
Um, on the 29th of September, they put in a further request for a further extension to take um, effect until the 2nd of December 2022. Um, and normally it's within my remit as monitoring officer, the conduct of those proceedings, like I said, without having to publish. But we chose to publish the decision that was taken in consultation with my portfolio holder to allow that extension to proceed because we thought it would be detrimental to the council's interest. And it's also in the public's best interest that we get as much information from the objector so that we can work with them, as we've said, to, to, to bring this matter to a, a, um, you know, a conclusion that is um, open, transparent, and that has given everyone the opportunity to review all the relevant documentation. We think that's really important. So that decision was taken. Um, documentation has been served, and we, there is an awful lot, as um, I know members will know, and you certainly as Chair of Audit will know the amount of documentation that has been involved in this matter. So that's all being currently reviewed. Um, another reason we chose to make that report public um, was due to the fact that this would probably put us in a position where the proceedings would go beyond the vesting date for the new authority. So rather than this being a Scarborough Borough Council matter in court, although obviously it is, it will in effect tip over, we think, on the advice of our council just due to court, you know, um, finding time within court and for our council to deal with it. So it, it is likely the proceedings will be heard after the 1st of April and therefore conduct will sit with the new authority, albeit um, you know, officers from this council will be transferring over so there is a continuity in terms of of uh, dealing with what has been an incredibly complex and, as, as we're all aware, long outstanding matter. So I hope that covers off the first question in relation to that. With regard to the um, KPMG um, VAT advice, yes, we have received that advice back from KPMG. It's fair to say it's a complex issue. And we are also aware, as you have alluded to, that there are court proceedings potentially on, I believe it's January the 23rd, um, and potentially other proceedings. On that basis, we have taken the decision that those um, that VAT advice, although um, the Section 151 officer has reviewed it, and uh, I think uh, our position as a council that we're, we're content with the advice that's been provided, in light of the ongoing legal proceedings, we've taken a view that it would not be appropriate to release that advice at this time. Um, and so um, the intention is when those proceedings are concluded, we will then release them to members and more, and more widely. Okay. Would you like to come back on those two? Please, if I may, not on the first one. I yeah, think Whitby okay. Harbours, unfortunately, is going to be a little bit like the fluval flow of the River Esk and the tide back and forth and back and forth for a long, long time, um, which is disappointing, I'll be honest. I feel that's very disappointing because, you know, we can always have challenge and counter challenge, but when the counter challenge and our subsequent challenges keep going on and on. There needs to be certainty, clarity and some galvanisation of decision, certainly because of the, uh, the wish to go forward with the Harbour Act and one thing or another to, to ensure there's some continuity of operations there. In regards to the KPMG, um, 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 I, I, I'll paraphrase, but you used the words that you were satisfied with the, with the advice given. I assume that's a positive satisfaction rather than a negative one. And um, can you give an opinion, although I will accept if you feel it's uh, unwise at this juncture to do so, but do you feel that the opinion within that report um, would have any positive benefit to the unfortunate individual businesses that have been summoned uh, for non-payment of DB upon many challenges? We know it's not just the VAT, there's many challenges there. Thank you. So, in relation to the court proceedings that are, are aligned for January, this is in relation to whether um, uh, our uh, businesses should have paid the levy and whether the, uh, the levy was lawfully uh, um, uh, called for and billed for in accordance with the legal process that is required to be done. Um, and I think, you know, I, it's difficult because obviously I'm, I'm representing the council from a legal proceedings in proceedings and it's... Uh, I wouldn't want to get into too much detail in the public domain in relation to that case. In relation to whether the, the issue around VAT, I think it's, it's a grey area whether it really affects those proceedings because I think, uh, you know, it, to be honest, it's almost a fairly straightforward argument as to whether the bill should have been paid or not at that stage. The VAT issue is, um, I, you know, I'm aware that people have talked about it may have relevance, which is 
kind of why I've just given you the answer I have about that we wouldn't seek to release it prior to those court proceedings. But I think the view would be that those proceedings are, in our eyes, fairly straightforward. That is without commenting on the merits of the case, and I want to be absolutely clear on this. I'm just giving an opinion as a lawyer and not intending for that in opinion to be taken in any way in relation to the, the situation of businesses within the borough, because I am aware of how highly emotive the situation is. So I'm, I'm simply responding, if you like, on a very factual basis as a lawyer with uh, that has conduct of those proceedings going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah. If it's a quick one. Uh, very quick one. Um, if it's a public report commissioned by the council, is there any reason why it shouldn't be released prior to the court dates? Uh, you know, I think that's a yes or no rather than a, a big arbitrary around that. And secondly, if the VA treatment was correct in the first place, it seems to me um, cautionable that Mazurs has accepted as a valid objection to the draft accounts that very element. And, and you know, we all know Mark Kirkham of old, of course, and the, these are scrutineers of the top level. And if that objection has been validated and accepted, and please can you confirm or otherwise, then I would have a nervousness moving forward without that report being public. Thank you. So I think, Leader, I've given the reason why we're not going to release it into the public domain at this time. It isn't a public report at this time. It was gathered by the Council um, to inform it, its position legally in relation to the VAT advice, so it isn't a public report at this time. But like I said, there is an intention to release it at, a, at an appropriate time, which is when these proceedings have been dealt with. It is a complex issue, um, and I think in relation to the Mazar's objection, I don't know whether uh, Mr Edwards or... Uh, Ms. Metcalf have got a comment on that because I'm, I'm not to speak with that. I think, I think actually, Councillor Bakas, you've probably got, uh, from a lawyer, you've got a really good answer there. Uh, got, got more detail than, uh, than, than maybe uh, you might be expecting. Apart from Mazur's leader. Okay, all right. Thank you. Could we please answer the Mazur's one? I think it's very important because if they have accepted an objection as a valid objection, on that particular subject matter, then clearly they see merit in pursuing that. And I've dealt with Mazurs and Mark Kirkham for many years with several audit hats, I'm not just here. So I would have a nervousness about that. I think in terms of the Mazars objections, so they um, have asked for further information. I think they're comfortable with the information. They just need to go through a process to satisfy themselves before they declare. Um, so I think Mazars are absolutely comfortable with the information we've provided and they will go through their due process um, uh, to resolve that, that objection. I don't think there's anything of um, major concern in terms of that. Just, and just, just to sort of further emphasise that, the fact that they've accepted the objection and are looking and have requested further information doesn't necessarily mean to say they agree with it, as we know with the Whitby Harbour accounts. Mm -hmm. They looked at it when the objection came in in relation to the Whitby Harbour accounts, decided whether, it, it, you know, and then they take a decision whether the council has acted appropriately or not. And I think that's the process they're going through now. Um, the, pro the time for us to, to say that there is something wrong is if they issue a statutory recommendation or the public interest report, which, as you know, they issued statutory recommendations in relation to Whitby. And those concluded that it was uncertain, so there was a further discussion to have. So I, I think at this stage, they're simply assessing whether there is something that they need to do further work for. Thank you. Um, and on question two, uh, I, I can hopefully answer that in that uh, I can advise you that we are in discussion with North Yorkshire uh, at the highest level. Um, in fact, Mr Edwards and I had a meeting yesterday uh, to discuss uh, the projects that we are that we are um, trying to deliver at the moment and that require section 24 approval uh, it was a very positive meeting uh, we're working through the detail um, we, we accept that the new authority will have questions and they're, they're coming to this cold and uh, and they're they're covering those those bases prudently and we're working with them to try and ensure that we make as much progress as possible before 1st of April. 
although we do accept that some of those schemes will run on beyond there and uh, and i think it's important that we keep that dialogue going that dialogue will continue on a very regular basis so i hope that answers your question thank you thank you councillor bakias for those questions um okay moving on now to item eight oh sorry we haven't voted on item seven yet have we uh, we had a proposal in council jefferson can i have a second uh, that council colin and uh, a vote uh, in favor of that report thank you that's everyone thank you very much thank you council Blackhouse. item eight performance management framework quarter two report Councillor jefferson thank you leader Just get organized This is the quarter two performance report, which covers the period April to September 22 inclusive. The council is committed to a performance management structure that underpins our focus on continuous improvement. The framework has been developed, the framework has been developed to include monitoring of more than just performance indicators and now incorporates monitoring of critical success factors, freedom of information request, sickness and complaints. The introduction of the Pentana risk system has allowed improvements to be made to the way in which we collect, monitor and report to Council. Attached to the report at Appendix 1 is a detailed analysis of performance for the quarter, which includes an analysis by corporate plan aim. Overall services are continuing to performing well, despite additional pressures arising from local government reorganisation and staffing issues in a number of key services. In terms of critical success factors, over 21% have already been completed, with a further 87% expected to be completed. A small number of critical success factors will now not be completed due to the impacts of the local government reorganisation. Critical success factors completed since the last performance report include Refurbishment and improvements at Scarborough Park Spa, including Suncourt toilets, backstage facilities at the Little Theatre. Installation of wayfinding, sign, wayfinding signage in Whitby and Scarborough. Development of an adrenaline sports strategy and continued support of the Barrowcliff Big Local Programme. In terms of performance indicators, over 80% are performing at a high or acceptable level. Areas performing particularly well include benefits, where a concerted effort to support residents and households most affected by the cost of living crisis is paying off, according to figures, with an increase in the accuracy of claims being processed and a reduction in the time taken to process new claims for local support for council tax. Pleasingly, there has been a reduction in the number of crimes and antisocial behaviour incidents in Scarborough. Increases have been seen in the number of visits to Scarborough Sports Village and users of Filey Evron Sender. Over 80% of market hall units in Scarborough Market are let. Scarborough Town Centre has had more than 2.2 million visits so far in 2022. In terms of areas where performance is highlighted at risk, again, officers are required to provide comments. And at the current time, the main issues, as previously said, relate to staff shortages and additional workloads, which are arising from impending local government reorganisation. Sickness levels remain low across the council. In respect of complaints, over 90% of responses are provided within 20 working days timescale. Similarly, with freedom of information requests, over 94% of responses are provided within 20 working days. Members are recommended to endorse the contents of this report, and in particular the good and satisfactory levels of performance being achieved by services at the current time. And again, I would thank Petrodaction, the author of this report, and all staff for their continued hard work under great pressure. We know that things are incredibly hard for many households throughout the borough this year, and that is why we have been focused on doing everything we can to help. 
I will now pass over to Petra to add any further details and hopefully answer any questions if they come. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. Anything you wish to add, Petra? Um, I, I think Councillor Jefferson's given a comprehensive overview, so it, unless anybody's got any questions. Okay, any questions, Councillor Colin? I do have one question, but I think I should direct it to Mr Bradley, if that's, unless you want to take it, Petra, which um, is around the Women's Refuge on the theme of things that we'd started and we wished we'd been able to conclude. I'm really disappointed to see that that hasn't progressed. I know there are good reasons, but could we just have a, a fuller explanation, please? Thanks, Leader. Yes, thanks, uh, Councillor Colling. So, Cabinet will recall that um, members approved the uh, the in principle sale um, of this particular piece of parcel of land, Dane's Dyke, to Beyond Housing, and subsequent to that, uh, Beyond have, have achieved planning uh, consent for that planning permission. Um, what Beyond have subsequently uh, found and experienced, however, is some viability pressures as a result of uh, cost building and construction cost price inflation uh, and related matters. So I had a, um, a very constructive uh, discussion with, with Beyond last week. This remains a corporate priority for Beyond. It still, um, it still has uh, full board support, which I think is important for members um, to hear. Um, and again, talking to portfolio holders, you know, my understanding it retains and remains um, a council priority as well. So th those two are, um, are important factors. So um, in discussions with, with Beyond, I would propose that we continue with the land transaction sale. Um, this will remain a priority for, for Beyond. And Beyond, um, as with other um, developers, are seeing some, um, some positives in terms of uh, forward building cost inflation reductions come March, April time of next year. Um, and it's hoped that those reductions in inflation will help uh, bridge the viability gap that currently exists um, and they um, again talking to, to beyond that they're confident that they can get this over the line in the fullness of time um, frustratingly for, for Scarborough Council it may not be uh, by the 31st of, of, um, of March but the long-term objective remains a priority for beyond is that okay Council Cole? okay thank you Mr Bradley any any other questions from anyone? No. Okay. Um, now, I agree with uh, Councillor Jefferson that uh, you know this is once again another good performance year, and uh, while, whilst there are uh, hiccups on things, which there always are, I think it's generally like the financial outturn has, has been another good year for the for the borough. So, um, have I got a, a proposal for this? Uh, do you want to propose this, Councillor Jefferson? Second, I'll, I'll give. Give Mr. Gre Councillor Grieve uh, a chance this time. Um, all those in favour of the report? Thank you. That's unanimous. Thank you, Petra. Right, moving on to item nine review of the Scarborough Borough Local Plan draft for consultation. Um, Councillor Collin. Thank you, Leader. Um, before I hand over to Mr Wilson, I'd like to make a couple of comments, please. It's a shame that we will not be progressing the local plan to its completeness, but as I'm sure you're all aware, the local government reorganisation means that although we are in a position to consult on our developed proposals, future work will be incorporated into the new, wider North Yorkshire Council local plan. The work that our officers have led leaves us in a great position with lots of data and information to be able to make the case for what this borough of Scarborough, with its unique geography and coastal community, communities, needs to see in this new wider local plan. I would like to place on record my thanks to the planning policy team for their commitment to this important piece of work, and I very much look forward to hearing the results of the consultation exercise. Secondly, there are a number of initiatives that we would have been taking forward in our own local plan um, that I know that our planning committee members have been greatly exercised about, including requiring new bills to meet national minimum space standards, to be energy efficient and to be carbon neutral, very appropriate given one of the items on the agenda today. I am again disappointed that we will now have to wait for the North Yorkshire plan, which informed by our work will, I hope, include these very, very critical issues. In the meantime, though, councillors will, of course, recall that our last cabinet meeting 
we were informed of the successful tender for a development partner, Lovell, for our Better Homes project. Key to that project will be that the new homes built by that partnership will meet all the high standards that we'd set ourselves um, around in the local plan, making sure that homes are fit for the future in terms of size, adaptability, energy efficiency, carbon neutrality and biodiversity. I look forward to seeing those ambitions realised in the first homes built. We now need to hear from the new North Yorkshire Council that they have given the requisite Section 24 approval so that we can progress with that work. Um, I'd like to hand over to Steve Wilson, our Planning Policy and Conservation Manager, to take any questions and introduce the report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Colin. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Colling. Uh, very quickly, only a couple of updates from Planning and Development Committee. Um, the first one, very minor. It was pointed out it's the Filey Vision and not the Filey Master Plan, which we will correct in the plan before we go to a consultation. And secondly, uh, members of planning committee uh, did raise the issue of the prime residence policy in light of the, uh, the, the issues of second homes and holder lets, uh, specifically in Whitby and, and Filey. And we're obviously disappointed that the plan didn't propose to include a policy um, to, to restrict new homes to primary residence only. Um, officers obviously are, are aware of the issue and done lots of work over the last couple of years uh, researching this, this matter and we understand that there is a, a potential issue there that, that needs to be looked into. However, I think the report clearly sets out that um, planning and policy um, in, in a form as proposed would not be the, the best way of addressing uh, that issue and it can be looked at in a number of other ways including through council tax uh, and, and government uh, guidelines, regulations to, to look at addressing that problem. Um, Notwithstanding that, you know, there is also the option for um, town councils or parish councils to bring forward a, a neighbourhood plan, uh, which I, we are aware that Farley and Whitby have applied to do so. So they could seek to address um, this issue through those neighbourhood plans, uh, you know, which would probably be a quicker way of doing that than going through the local plan process anyway. Um, those are the only two issues I wanted to update on since the Planning and Development Committee and obviously subject to member approval, we'll get a consultation in mid-January for a period of six weeks and we'll obviously feed back any responses we receive. Thank you, Leah. Uh, thank you. That's answered my question, which is when, when will the consultation go out. Um, any, any questions or comments that anyone wants to make on this? Councillor John Eamon Creef. Um, I did uh, email uh, Mr Walker and, and, and Councillor Colling uh, yesterday. I think obviously part of the national debate around housing is whether or not government should or shouldn't set targets. And I suppose um, I have to admit that sometimes it's very hard to work out at the moment what exactly government policy is on most issues and housing seems to be one that changes by the week. Uh, but we'll also obviously be aware that government has abandoned it's um, the idea of top-down targets for housing. And I suppose the, the first question I just wanted to raise is what material impact does that actually have on the implementation and the creation of a local plan and the setting of those targets? Because I think sometimes what people read in the national media gives them the impression that that means the whole local plan process doesn't matter, that all these sites can be removed. And I just wonder sort of from a professional uh, officer's point of view and the work in terms of getting a local plan adopted by the plan inspector, how much material impact does that have in your work? Thank you, Councillor. Uh, in terms of the, the housing tags from government, they are obviously um, a, a baseline, a bottom, you know, and you can go over and above that in terms of your local plans. In, in terms of the impact on, on what would have been Scarborough Borough local plan, it would have no or minimal impact. We've always gone over and above um, the government's targets for housing uh, in this area, the, the current target sat, sat, sat nationally is about 170 homes a year. The current local plan um, aims to deliver 450 and has done, and the review was proposing to target 350 a year. So in terms of the impact on, on this area, uh, it would be a minimal impact because we, we always go over and above that. Obviously, um, in terms of going forward with North Yorkshire Council, um, you know, there'll be more evidence that will have to be prepared. We've we prepare what's called a strategic housing market assessment that looks at local needs, uh, obviously across the entire county area in, in the future, and that will set or, or seek to set a target that we can achieve. Clearly, that target should be previously above um, government, minimum government targets, um, but that has always been the case. It's always been above there because need generally in this area is higher than, than the targets set there. So overall, I don't believe it will have any significant impact, uh, the loss of these national targets. You okay with that, Councillor Dargan Okay, any other questions? 
Councillor Jefferson. It isn't really a question, it's more an observation. I've received uh, one or two emails, but the local plan people have got to realise there's a consultation, and this is why we ask them to give their opinions. Uh, but I've had some um, comments with regard to uh, 7.15 and 7.16 in regard to our harbours. Um, I think one person in particular has taken exception that this industry is declined, described as declined. And, and over the last year, some of the issues, like the shellfish mortality, is beyond their control. But I'll just clarify, as I've done before, that the report that DEFRA made is being further looked into by government. So I hope that that will clear that side of it up. And as I say, I want to emphasise to them all uh, that this is a consultation and it is the best time to, to give your views. I'm writing that. The other thing, I think, uh, moving forward on page 96, was the licensing of holiday lets. I think that's an initial step forward um, because, um, as we know, we, as, as a county, we had to make a decision last month with regard to the council tax issue on second homes, which in turn do become holiday lets because they don't pay rates. And I think this is the big, really big bugbear within residents, I think, throughout this borough, that there are people, it's a business, yes, but they've got themselves qualified for small business rate relief. But we need to, to really unravel something where we can make it that some monies are coming forward. Not least, I've, I've put the word in because it's, it always is a contested word, parking. And if you look at some of the advertisements for these holiday lets, it clearly says free on street parking. Well, I think we need to bring that into it in some way. I don't know how, but some way we've got to bring it into it. Because, yes, the residents get free on street parking, but they are paying rates. And the visitors to these units aren't. So somewhere along the line with this licensing, I know it's early days, Steve, but I just wanted to record that as my feelings. Thank you. An excellent piece of work, though. Thank you very much. Um, if I can just add a point on the parking for residents. Um, uh, it's, it's worth noting that uh, this council's administration has been in discussion with North Yorkshire about parking uh, in relation to this matter and, and other matters. And uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, a consultation will take place uh, in the new year on, on parking and how parking should, should be developed and progressed in order to meet the the changes that have taken place, I suppose, over the last few years in the way that, that people park uh, and the usage they make of the free on street parking. So, so that will come up to consultation in the new year. I think it, you, you hit the nail on the head there. It's the expectation of people and that they, that they should, because it's a holiday home, be part of a resident scheme. Well, they're not a permanent resident. And I mm -hmm. think that differential, but as you know, I'm working with Area 3 on this because I've, I've pushed and pushed for four or five years now to get this review. And, and I'm glad you've given that confirmation that I did know it was going to start in the new year, which will help everyone. Thank mm. you. Okay. Um, Councillor Donovan Moncrief. Uh, not, not just some um, ob observations um, at this time. I think, I, I, I feel like in the last couple of years, I feel like I've had to live and breathe the local plan. I have had, I think one point I'll just make, um, and I've often made this to residents firstly is, when planning, once a site is designated a new local plan, that has significance. Um, I think sometimes it's not often understood the significance or the level of work that goes through before a site is designated um, in, in any area. Um, and I certainly know that in, in my ward, it's, uh, it's often very difficult. Sometimes people have not realised sometimes that they are actually living near a, a local plan site, and that's why the planning application has come in. Uh, but I think the key point about the local plan review is clearly when sites come forward, it can create an awful lot of um, upset in a village or in, in, a, in, a, in any area. And the point I made to people all the way through this process is you have to let the process go through. You have to start with the top level, which is the strategic housing marketing assessment. You have got to let it be done. You've got to let, make sure that it is a document that stands up to scrutiny and that it is something that, and then we will derive everything else from that rather than a situation where anybody who owns a piece of land can put in a planning application and there's no criteria by which we decide whether or not housing is a good idea on those sites or not. And, and I think it's, you know, it is a, 
a mammoth piece of work. It is a difficult piece of work, but it is a hugely important piece of work. But it also gives, and the point I've always made to the public is, they actually have more input into this process than they would into a planning application, and more interaction, and therefore they've got more, ab and more ability to challenge. And I just, you know, I think it's an important point going forward. Now, I appreciate clearly uh, the, new, the new North Yorkshire Council has every right to take its own uh, view on a local plan, but I do hope it takes into account this work um, going forward, because there's a risk here that we just keep re we end up reconsulting, and I don't want a new council going back in consulting on something that residents have already contributed to. It isn't fair on them, it doesn't make, and it isn't fair on, on the officers who have done, have done the work. Uh, just a, and a couple of points as well I just want to make. As the new council goes forward, it does seem to be Focus on constituency areas. The reality is in planning is that we have functional economic areas and we have areas to interact with each other. And it is important that local plan work going forward is done around sensible boundaries, not, because the constituency boundary that I'm in is not a functional economic area. It is a political area, but we have zero relationship with the rest of that constituency. And I also have actually people that are slightly over border from Scarborough Borough at the moment who actually look towards Scarborough Borough as their economic area. So I do hope there is some common sense in terms of the local plans that we get made. And my final point, and again I'm not at the end, is our friends in uh, City of York Council. Uh, as, we are as we are going to be moving forward to a regional basis of York, North Yorkshire, City of York Council cannot persist with the arguments that have been repeatedly made that everybody else will deliver the housing and it's not really our job. And I'm sorry that has been made at the local plan review, it has been made by councillors, it has been made by parish councillors presenting to the planning inspector. It is not acceptable to accept communities in this area or anywhere else in North Yorkshire to provide housing because they won't do their job. It's a cop-out. And they have to, you know, we're, we have to take it on the chin. We have to take the, you know, the upset of residents. They need to do their job. They are a city and they need to stop playing games over their local plan because other communities are having to then take on the housing and that's having a wider impact on the region. If they want to be part of the region, they have to take responsibility over housing and the delivery of new housing, just as other areas have. And that's just my observation. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, any other questions or comments? No, I think that's had a good airing. Uh, okay, so the recommendations are, are set out in the report. Can I have a proposal and a seconder and uh, the show of hands? Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. Right, moving on to item 10, York and North Yorkshire route map to carbon negative. Um, Councillor on Hume on Creek. Yeah, thank you, Leader. Uh, obviously, we're bringing this forward today. It is um, firstly an endorsement of the, the Local Enterprise Partnerships um, route map to carbon negative, which covers the whole York, um, North Yorkshire region. Uh, region. Uh, the work done is evidence-based. It sets out how we would achieve the carbon negative. I think it's very important when we talk about um, net zero and carbon negative, people often project onto it what they think the measures are that would deliver that. I think this sets out a comprehensive plan of how you would achieve that in this region. It will allow, um, going forward, for, do, for us to be able to measure how, how, what we are achieving, what measures are working, if measures aren't brought forward, what other measures uh, need, need to be brought in in order to achieve that. Uh, it also asks us to, to note the uh, progress on um, uh, the climate change strategy in the council, uh, which uh, you know we have, as you say, um, achieved um, significant uh, reductions in um, carbon emissions over the last couple of years. Uh, the work done on the strategy has really, I think, set, I think we are handing over on vesting day a really solid base, baseline for going forward in terms of climate change strategy. I know that the county are trying to develop their, their climate change strategy. I think this is a case as well of there is a risk with local government reorganisation that the work being done around climate change and these strategies can get lost, in, un understandably lost in all the other issues that the, that the new council needs to look at. Uh, and, and I just want to make a couple of points. We, we talked today about financial capital being given to the county council. 
we also are um, passing them on, I think, some really wonderful human capital and, and people that have got excellent experience. And I just wanted to uh, pay tribute to two people. Firstly, to Harry for putting up with me put <laughs> so early on in his career. Uh, I'm sure it's been a, but he has been absolutely um, superb. I think he's been a breath of fresh air. I think he's brought real focus within the council across departments onto this issue and got, and got us moving forward. And I hope that the uh, new North Yorkshire Council understand what a, a bright, brilliant asset they have and that they give him the opportunity uh, to, to continue on this excellent work. I just want to thank as well Paul Thompson. Uh, when I took on this early on in the portfolio, I did speak to Mike Green at the time saying what we didn't have clear directoral um, focus from the, in the leadership team, somebody had clear um, responsibility and that's been really, really helpful and I think it's important, I know it, there is going to be an assistant director of um, climate change on, on, on the, uh, the new council, it is important that we have somebody at a senior level who can focus on this issue, yes it cuts across departments but you do need somebody who has that core responsibility and I just want to thank Paul as well for his work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Harry, do you want to... Uh introduce this or add anything to, to what Councillor William McCreeve said? Yes, thank you, Leader. You don't need to say anything about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to stop blushing before I read what I've written down. <laughs> but yeah, thank you, Leader, uh, and thank you, Councillor Donoghue McCreeve, for the introduction and, and the kind words. The, the paper in front of you today, as the Councillor has said, presents an opportunity to both recognise the good work currently ongoing to tackle climate change in Scarborough and to endorse the really strong ambitions for future climate change am, uh, activity across York and North Yorkshire in the route map to carbon negative. Members will be aware that Scarborough Borough Council was one of the first councils in the country to announce a climate emergency in 2019 and we adopted a climate change strategy in 2021 to drive forward this work. Over the past few years, several of the other councils in York and North Yorkshire have also declared a climate emergency and all have some sort of strategy, action plan or, or other similar document outlining their climate activity as well as individual organisations. There are other key organisations in our area as well which have committed to climate change action from large businesses like Anglo-American to academic institutions like Coventry University, University of York and our many third sector organisations who are very active in this sphere as well. Such work at the scale of individual organisations is really important to tackling climate change, but it's also absolutely critical that we ensure an, a holistic and joined up approach at a regional and local level, so that the actions of each organisation best complement one another and also work towards shared goals, as, as Councillor Donoghue Moncrief outlined earlier. The, the route map to carbon negative, as developed by the York and North Yorkshire Local Enterprise Partnership in, uh, in collaboration with, with ourselves and several of our partners, is the key document that ties together all this climate activity in, in York and North Yorkshire. The route map is based on over two years of evidence gathering, data analysis and local consultation. It presents a co-owned plan to deliver net zero by 2034 across the region and then to go even further and be England's first carbon negative region by 2040. The document presents a series of challenging ambitions for the region and targeted actions to deliver those ambitions. Ambitions for 2038 include the installation of 2,500 megawatts of renewable energy capacity, retrofitting up to a quarter of a million homes to a good EPCC standard, having over three quarters of vehicles be battery electric, and planting 37,000 hectares of new woodland. As a document for the entire region and not just any single organisation or single sector, it is recognised that no single actor is responsible for all of these ambitions. So, for example, it is not suggested that Scarborough Borough Council, or indeed the new North York Council, will be the one to plant all 37,000 hectares of new woodland, but instead that we act where we can to create an environment in which this can be achieved. There are, however, some specific actions in the route map for which local authorities in general are highlighted as lead or partner organisations. These are largely around ensuring climate change is fully embedded into key policies like the local plan um, so that we can best utilise our place shaping role. And there's also uh, actions in there around utilising government funding that's available to local authorities to implement larger programmes of work where appropriate, such as things like uh, government funding for retrofit. Overall, the actions in the route map highlighted for local authorities match very closely with the actions currently undertaken by the Council and, com and contained within our climate change strategy. So there's nothing new for, for the Council in this document. 
The headline ambitions in the route map to be net zero by 2034 and carbon negative by 2040 were recognised positively by central government in the devolution process and were allocated £7 million of funding as part of a devolution deal subject to business case approval. The recommendation, uh, as has been outlined by Council Donoghue Moncrief, is for Cabinet to endorse the route map to carbon negative. An endorsement of the route map will demonstrate our continued commitment to tackling climate change at a local and regional level. And importantly, it will improve the likelihood of achieving the challenging ambitions in the document. It also adds impetus and generates support for the existing climate change actions at our Council. The route map has already been endorsed by a number of organisations in the region, including the North York Moors National Park Authority and Craven District Council. For clarity, members and leader, the recommendation to endorse is not equivalent to a recommendation to adopt, and as such it will not form part of the Council's formal policy framework. Nevertheless, it still shows strong commitment to the document and the ambitions contained within. I'd now like to turn to the positive action we are taking as the Council to combat climate change, action which is, of course, at the heart of the route map to carbon negative. We've made great strides in reducing our own emissions and supporting decarbonisation across the borough, with our actions providing both a clear legacy for Scarborough Borough Council and creating a strong springboard for the new council. On operational emissions, we are currently projected to drastically reduce our carbon emissions as a council this year, as a result largely of the hydro-treated vegetable oil trial in many of our diesel vehicles. This biofuel has around 90% lower emissions than diesel and could be responsible for reducing our emissions by around 800 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. In addition to decarbonisation works at a number of our properties, these works could see our emissions down by around 60% this year compared to last year. Across the borough, we continue to utilise government funds to implement energy saving and decarbonisation measures to our homes through schemes such as the Energy Company Obligation, Green Homes Grant Local Authority Delivery Scheme and the Home Upgrades Grant, something that I know many residents will, uh, and members will aware is very timely at the moment. Indeed, at the moment, the latest phase of this work is currently open to residents to apply for with those with a household income of below £30,000 and living in a home with an EPC rating of D or below, potentially able to get an average of £10,000 worth of energy efficiency work done at their property for free, or if you're off the gas grid, that number is up to £25,000. The works include things like loft insulation, wall insulation, solar PV and heat pumps. The project is called North Yorkshire Energy Efficiency Scheme. It's been run by Yes Energy Solutions on behalf of ourselves. Uh, the County Council and a few other local, um, local authorities, so I strongly recommend any residents who feel they would be eligible for, for that to, to engage with Yes Energy Solutions on that. Members will also be aware of the ongoing works to deploy EV charge points across the borough, with Civil's works now thoroughly underway for the installation of 48 charge points across 18 locations, and this is what we believe to be the largest project of its kind in the north of England this year. A number of the Council's keystone projects also include a range of climate change actions built in. As we've heard, the Better Homes joint venture is proposing to install things like heat pumps and high levels of insulation as standard. And improvements to Scarborough Station, for example, as part of the town deal, are providing an improved hub for, for public transport and active travel. The Council also continues to play a central role in enabling greater climate activity in our economy and communities. So with projects such as the Green Construction Skills Village, we're supporting the next generation of green jobs. And we also continue to support the Circular Scarborough programme to enable a range of bottom-up climate actions to take place in our area as part of a circular economy. These actions span the range of teams and services at the Council, showing how thoroughly climate change activity has been embedded into our organisation. The recommendation today, as, as Councillor Donoghue Moncrief outlined, is to note progress on this activity. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. That's really impressive, isn't it? That's, uh, when, you, when you hear all that, uh, all read out like that, it's, um, it's really impressive. And I think it's worth um, remembering that uh, something that was said to me right at the beginning was, uh, if, if North Yorkshire can't become carbon negative, uh, what chance has the rest of the country to, to even be carbon balanced? It's, uh, I suppose we've, we've got a, an additional duty, I suppose, than, than, than maybe others. Any, any other comments or questions anyone has? Okay, so the recommendation before us is uh, to endorse York and North Yorkshire's route map to carbon negative and to note the progress on the climate activity in line with climate change strategy. Can I have a proposal and a second, uh, Councillor, Councillor uh, Randerson, Councillor Donny Human-Creeve, uh, and all those in favour? Thank you. 
Thank you. That's unanimous. Thank you, Harry. Mm. Item 11. Uh, disposal of land at the site of the former Scarborough Sport and Tennis Centre, Firely Road. Um, Councillor Collin. Thank you, Leader. Um, I hope you um, approve the innovative proposals for this site that are brought forward in this report. Um, three key things here. Securing the future of tennis provision in the town, which we've looked forward to for some time. Bringing back into use the listed pavilion, which I think is a, a laudable aim, and also providing some new residential accommodation, but that is in keeping with the local area. I'll hand you over to Chris Bourne, Head of Projects, um, for any more words he wants to say and any questions anyone might have. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, Chris. Yeah, morning, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, so the report that the Cabinet has in front of them this morning is in respect of the approval of the development brief that has been prepared for the site and also an in principle decision for the disposal of the former sports centre site. Um, so it's just that in principle decision at the moment, not the full decision with all the detail to dispose. Um, I'm sure that members will be aware that this site has been marketed before a number of times. There has been a planning application on this site which was not managed to bring to successful fruition. And so what we've tried to do is to bring forward a development brief by working with a lot of the interested parties and particularly the statutory authorities that hold a lot of controlling interest in the site to make sure that we can provide some guidance to developers that when they do come forward to develop the site, they ought to be assured that if they follow the development brief, the guidance and the guidance, they ought to be assured of a, of a planning permission. Um, the site does have a lot of complexities on it, and I'm sure members are aware of, of what those are. Um, it's in a conservation area. It's got a long-standing historic sporting use on the site, and allied to that becomes brings in Sport England and their role as well to protect the sporting interest. And it's also got listed buildings on the site and that brings in Historic England and, uh, and, and their obligations. So this brief has been prepared in consultation with all of those organisations and also including the Lawn Tennis Association and the local planning authority. And it's basically to try and overcome these development challenges. And so what we've done is we've divided the site up into three and there's a Appendix C in your report that shows the, uh, the division of the site. And the in-principle approval that the Cabinet has been asked to give this morning is first of all the, the area marked green on the most southern end of the site. And that is a disposal on a long lease to a community trust who will operate, will refurbish the tennis courts and operate them for full community use. Um, so that's great because that retains a sporting use on the site and that meets the requirements of Sport England, requirements of Scarborough Borough Council's tennis strategy as well to provide four more courts in, in the area. The second in principle disposal is the area marked red in the middle of Appendix C, and that is dis the disposal of the existing listed pavilion to Scarborough College. And their proposal is to, to refurbish that building, and I'm sure most of you who are familiar with it will know it is, is in need of some refurbishment, and it's challenging because it is a listed building, but their proposal is to refurbish that and bring it back into use for student residential accommodation, something that the college uh, have, a, have a great need for. And then the final disposal in principle that you are asked to make today is the area shaded blue to the most northern end of the site. And that's the remainder of the site, including the listed grandstand, and that will be disposed of for residential development. Um, by way of discussions with Historic England, we have ascertained that they would be supportive of the demolition of the listed grandstand on the condition that the pavilion was brought sympathetically refurbished and brought back into use. So what you can begin to see is that these things are linked. Although you are disposing of the site separately, we're going to have to build into the sale agreements conditions that require the developments to be brought forward in certain stages. Um, because of the sensitivity of this site, um, prior to this meeting, the report was presented to the Places and Futures Overview and Scrutiny Committee to its meeting on the 20th of November, and that was for pre-decision scrutiny. 
Um, some of the things that the Cabinet ought to note from that meeting was that the committee, committee voted unanimously in favour of the proposals and that the members of the scrutiny committee were very supportive of proposals to retain tennis at the site by way of the leasehold disposal to the community trust and that the public access that that would bring. Members also recommended to Cabinet that a clause would be inserted into the disposal contract to the College to enable the Council to buy back the site should the development not take place within a specified period of time. So in other words, if the development stalled and it didn't come forward, the Council could take the site back. And then finally, there was discussions about the, the density of the de development in residential purposes and whether 24 homes was appropriate. That represents a, a 9.8 dwellings per acre rate, which is considered low development um, in planning terms. Members were in agreement with officers that that was the preferred option in the development brief and that it was acceptable based on that it was a significant improvement on the previous development proposals, which had 42 development, um, dwellings on the site. So on that basis, the um, Overview Scrutiny Committee were, were recommending that Cabinet uh, endorse the report. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, any comments from anyone? Um, I think, for me, this, this is obviously in my ward. Uh, it's an area I know very well. I, I walk uh, across that site on a regular basis. And, uh, and I think that the proposals that, that have been put forward are, will create, a, for the reasons you've just said, will create a vast improvement for for not only uh, the residents who live close by there, but, but for everyone who lives on the south side uh, and the centre of town, because they will be able to use those facilities. Um, I, I think that uh, it, it's long overdue and we, we do need to make some progress with that. Um, can I have um, a show of hands uh, in support of that, please? That seems to be unanimous. So that's uh, unanimously in support of uh, of the next stage of that process, the prin in principle decision. Okay, uh, that's the end of uh, this cabinet meeting, the end of the agenda. Thank you everyone for attending. And um, if we don't see people before, have a good Christmas and 